Good morning. Good morning. Um, sorry, a slightly delay there. I, I was taken up by the chat because I think there was some demand that we should just carry on with the music rather than getting into this um, get into this session. But uh, here we are. Let's get going. Uh, I'm Kerry Thomas. I'm one of the editors here at Tortoise. And if you've just joined us, um, a very warm welcome to uh, this session of today's Tortoise AI Summit. And just briefly, a quick thanks to our partners in this, uh, Henkel X and Capita, who've been so important in making it happen. For those of you who haven't been to a thinker before, it's, um, it's an alarmingly simple thing. Um, I'm going to kick off the discussion with our invited guests, um, but most of all what we want is to hear from as many of you as possible. We just have the one rather loosely enforced rule, which is that we want to hear what you think, we want to hear your expertise, we don't really want, to, we don't really want questions, because what we want to do is for ourselves and for everybody here to come away from this conversation um, with a better informed point of view about the thing that we're, we're talking about. And there are two ways for you to join in. You can look for the chat box on your screen, somewhere down the bottom there, um, and that's the place where you can share your thoughts and your expertise with my colleague Liz Mosley, who'll be moderating that discussion uh, brilliantly, as she always does, or you can raise your digital hand, and again, there's a button you can see that allows you to do that. Um, and uh, I'll be looking out for that and I will come to you directly and we'll try to bring you into the conversation as soon as we see your, your hand up. Um, a reminder for me as much as anybody else that the question we've set ourselves for this session is about AI as a, na as a national strategy. And the question we've asked is, will the race continue as before? So this, I guess, is the session where technology meets global politics and we get a chance to think our way through how the strategies of different countries and regions intersect with their capacity in this area and their values and, the, and their politics. Um, in other words, there's quite a lot to get through here. Now, all of this was in play, of course, um, before the coronavirus, and you could see dramatically how talent and money were moving around the world in pursuit of advances in machine learning and AI, and how keenly some of the countries uh, involved felt that competition. And then along comes the pandemic and it raises some huge questions. Does it potentially slow down that race because um, I don't know, investment capital might be in short supply? Does it speed it up because countries want to seize this moment to, to put their economies onto a different footing or simply because competition between countries is exacerbated by the, the nature of the pandemic? Or does it refocus it? Does it, for example, say, actually, there's nothing in the world more important than healthcare at the moment, and maybe money will flow into uh, more precisely into areas of concern like that. So it's great to have with us three people who are really expert um, in all the things we want to talk about. Um, we have with us Sir John Soares, who was former head of MI6 and before that the UK's representative at the United Nations. Good morning, John. I'll come to you in a second. Um, we've got Sana Karagani, who is the head of the UK Government Office for AI. Sana, good morning. And we have Nigel Toon, who uh, many of you will know, is CEO of Graphcore, which is a semiconductor company that makes hard, develops hardware for AI and machine learning. Um, John, can I start with you? Um, because I guess one of the things I'm interested to know is that, that there's always been a tech race. Um, you know, there's, there's been a tech race probably since gunpowder was in, invented and maybe before that. Um, do you think there's something qualitatively different about the AI tech race uh, as opposed to all that came before? Well, I think it is that there are similarities and then there are, there's the modern context in which we're operating in. Um, I think, as you say, there's always been this sense of how can you get ahead, especially in military technology? We saw this in all the wars uh, of the last four or five centuries, is that the, uh, <clears throat> the side with the better military technology quite often ended up with the upper hand in the, in the conflict. What is different here, I think, is that uh, we're uh, <clears throat> seeing a technology competition in the context of a worsening relationship between the world's two great powers, the United States and China, <clears throat> and technology is at the heart of that. Not just military technology, and that, but that is a part of it. But it's that sense of, uh, because these two countries have roughly equal sized economies, uh, they are using the, uh, their economic platform as a vehicle for projecting power, for their influence and control in the world, <clears throat> and of course, to defend themselves from one another. 
And um, AI um, uh, the, uh, is, a, is a central feature in that, uh, in that race. It's part of a, a wider technology race. I think when we look at the technology competition between America and China, you see the United States is ahead in its global companies, in its operating software, in control of certain crucial uh, components like semiconductors. And you see China is ahead in, for example, the Internet of Things, it makes over 90% of the components for the Internet of Things. It's ahead in uh, telecoms network infrastructure equipment and the argument of a Huawei is central to that. It's, a, it's ahead in battery technology and in some of the crucial materials you need for batteries like uh, cobalt and lithium and rare earth minerals. So uh, there are different areas where the two countries are ahead. In AI, they're approaching it in a different, in a different way. America, because of its nature, using mainly private sector, uh, massive research, backed up by, by uh, Department of Defense spending as well. I think in, um, in China, you're seeing very much a state-led uh, effort. And I, I'm not an expert, uh, Nigel and Sana may have a, a better assessment of this than me. My sense is it's too early to tell which side is ahead, uh, but we all have very much echoing in our minds what Vladimir Putin said three years ago, which is that the, uh, the, the country that uh, uh, leads on AI will rule the world. Um, now, that's a rather simplistic sort of Putin-esque way of putting things, but there's no doubt it is central to the mindset of how both America and China are approaching the whole AI issue as part of a technology race. Yeah. And John, it's interesting, we framed this um, as, a, as a global race. Um, and there's already a bit of con conversation in the chat about whether a race is the right way to see it. But you've gone straight to the US-China question. I effectively, is that the race as you see it? Is, is everybody else a bit part player? Well, Europe shouldn't be a bit part player because Europe's economy is, is actually roughly the same size as the United States or China's. Um, but we've not been good at Europe at converting pure research, in particular the case here in the UK, converting pure research into mega companies. You've got excellent companies like DeepMind that started in the UK and what happened? Google bought it up uh, and we weren't able to convert it from a very good startup into a really uh, global company, uh, which we've done in the older sectors like uh, uh, energy or mining or banking, but we've not been able to do in the new technology sectors. So Europe, I think Europe, um, uh, for a long time thought it could somehow get the best of both worlds. It could maintain our sort of political and, and defense alliance with the United States, but we could treat China as an equal economic partner. I think one thing that COVID has done is it's really taken the scales uh, from the eyes of many Europeans about the nature of this new Chinese regime. Um, we like to think that US-China relations have got worse because of Donald Trump and has rather demonized Trump as a figure and I, can, I have some sympathy with that. Uh, but uh, actually most of the changes come from the Chinese side um, and the Chinese have become much more assertive uh, uh, in its region. We're seeing what China is doing in Hong Kong, in the South China Sea. We're seeing what it's doing in the cyber domain. Uh, and we're also seeing how much more repressive China is inside, uh, in, inside China. I think some of the scales are falling from the eyes of Europeans that you can't somehow have a comfortable midway point and we're going to have to strategically um, uh, align ourselves in the United States in this. But I think those are the two main battles. Of course, countries like India will play a role in this. Uh, there'll be uh, specialist uh, countries. Israel is a good example. Russia has good military defense technology, but the big players will be China and the United States. Yeah, you, I mean, you've touched there on, on some of the, some of the, the values, uh, the, the difference in values between China and the United States. In that, and part of this is a competition over values and what, what's permissible in different, different parts of the world. Will, will the nature of the pandemic and, and the way that the Chinese state can deal with it, the, the, the fact that it, it, it may have greater permission to, to track and trace, it may have greater permission to, do, to, to, to intrude um, into people's privacy than, than, than we might find in other parts of the world. Do you think, is there a risk that will allow China to emerge from this pandemic stronger than countries which have to contend with democratic institutions and push back on a variety of things? Well, there's a risk of that, Kerry, but I don't think it's uh, the argument is settled. 
I think there are some areas where authoritarian countries um, are, uh, have an advantage. You've, you've identified some of them, uh, the ability to impose really rigid lockdowns or to uh, exploit data. Um, there are other areas where dem democracies have a real advantage. We have a self-correcting mechanism. We have a free flow of information. Part of the problem in China was they suppressed the information early on, uh, which uh, actually made the, the, uh, the, the um, uh, pandemic much worse inside China itself and globally. If China had uh, had a free flow of information and reacted sooner, we may not be all in the, it may not all have been in the mess that we're in at the moment. I think one area, particularly on AI, where China does have a, a, an advantage, is there are no restraints on their collection and use of data. Quite rightly, in the West, uh, we pride ourselves on individual privacy as being part of the free society which we enjoy and which we, uh, you know, the, the organizations I used to work to, the whole purpose of, of the intelligence and security services was to uphold the freedoms and the privacy of the uh, society that we, we operate in. China does have a head, head start. They set up a surveillance system inside their major cities, which is so intrusive and so powerful it's the sort of control mechanism that Joseph Stalin would have died for, uh, because it is very, very extensive, very effective and non-violent. Uh, uh, and, and that does give them an advantage in this area, because AI, machine learning, relies very heavily on the mass collection of data and be able to crunch that data, manipulate that data, apply it to individuals as well as at the group level, um, uh, 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 which quite rightly in the West, we have constraints on. China has no such constraints. Yeah. OK, um, John, thanks. We'll come back to you in a second. Um, Sarah, let me let me turn to you, if I may. Um, I don't want to be rude in framing this as a as a US China um, race. What, what was what's your view of the sort of global picture? What was your view of it before the pandemic? And then maybe we can talk about how the pandemic might change that. Yeah, of course. Um, so I uh, have been fortunate. I've been one of the advisors on the Tortoise um, AI uh, kind of index and we've been working with the team over there to, to think about what are all of the all of the different um, criteria by which you can start to make that assessment um, and there are multiple criteria and I think uh, you know you guys are the experts but I think there was in the hundreds in terms of the number of different um, criteria by which you could you could start to measure um, how well countries were doing in 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 kind of development of AI technologies um, so that you're comparing them on a level playing field. Um, there is, you know, they, I, I, I like to refer to kind of AI rather than as a sector, as an ecosystem, because there's a lot of different parts that come together. Um, the three big ones are the private sector, which we've been talking about, so kind of what's happening in the economy, um, the public sector, so what is government doing, what, you know, how is it funding it, how is it driving its massive demand side lever, um, and also there is um, academia research and, and, um, and thought leadership. Um, I completely agree with with the uh, what was said previously about you know we haven't been great at going from research to production and research into applications, but we're getting much 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 better at that. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, unfortunately, but um, in terms of investment into the UK and in terms of the number of unicorns that we have, one of whom the CEOs is sitting here today on the panel, um, I think it's worth considering that you know. The US and China, yes, are leading in a, in a specific way in terms of how much investment they're putting in to, um, into AI, but in terms of focus, dedication, thought leadership, uh, the UK is up there along with other countries like Canada, Germany, France as well. Um, so I, I, I do think that there, um, there are more than, more than kind of funding uh, criteria that should go into that. Yeah. Um, before we, I come back, I think one other thing just to say is that um, you asked well, whether it's the same kind of pre as post um, this pandemic. I think one of the things that's come into very strong focus through the pandemic is just international collaboration. Um, we now have a global shared issue challenge um, and our scientists and uh, are, are, are all working together to try and solve that. And this collaboration is, is incredible. Um, we have always been of a, of a mindset that uh, collaboration and sharing of best practice um, allows us to move much, much more quickly and, and joining up with like-minded countries allows us to do that. 
Um, and we've worked quite a long way in terms of how do we ensure that we are aligning our policies to allow better movement for our companies, to give our own UK-based companies access to a broader uh, societal base to sell into, for example, right? And that requires a level of kind of government policy coordination internationally to let that happen. So for us, it's, it's hugely important from that perspective, but also just allowing scientists to collaborate means that you uh, accelerate thinking and accelerate innovation. And, and that's something that we're very much behind. And I think that's one of the things that's become come into very sharp focus. Um, at, since the pandemic. Yeah. And, and Sina, do you think, because it seems to be an open question, whether that sort of collaboration is going to continue or, or retreat somewhat after this pandemic, because you, you can make the case that it's more urgent than ever, but equally you could make the case um, that actually the, the, the sort of onshoring, the reshoring of talent and resources and supply chains and all those things that we're hearing as part of this pandemic could be a bigger feature of life um, from here on. Are you confident that actually collaboration is going to survive what we're going through? I so it's a hope, and I'm I'm a I'm a truly optimistic person, and I think I I, I would um I would refer you to a few things that are happening, right? So um I think you know th this summit is a good example of it, but also a number of different ways where uh, actually working across boundaries, we've removed all of the the kind of our own perceptions and barriers that we previously had in terms of I need to get on a plane and I need to physically go to this event. Um, I was on a, uh, on a panel with the British Embassy in Washington yesterday, um, sat inside you know, my house, um, as were others that you know, had joined from Germany and France and, you know, and the US as well. So in, I think that level of collaboration, that level of bringing experts together to speak, but also to work together um, is going to flatten some of this. And um, I do think that it's important, again, with everything, context is hugely important. So yes, you're absolutely right. This kind of onshoring and making sure we, as a country we're stable and able to you know, produce our own equipment or food or whatever that may be. So that kind of, question around globalization and whether or not that that stays and what what shape that takes is very different to technology and what that has enabled. So I guess my position on this would be a hope that a lot of the doors that we've opened through this pandemic in terms of allowing collaboration to happen across borders and internationally, we should be writing that down, you know, taking notes, figuring out how did we do that so it doesn't go away because together we become much, much more resilient to, uh, you know, to quote Paul Clark, we need to be more resilient in peacetime to, you know, stop ourselves from falling into, into where we are now for the next quote unquote war, right? Yeah, and, and, and Sana, when you think about the UK's particular strengths in AI and machine learning going into this, um, are there aspects of that that make you think there is, that it will give a focus to our efforts that could be useful? Um, so one of the main, one of the major kind of uh, positives or uh, the strengths of the UK have been its, its skills base. So the, the thought leadership that the UK has. Um, and the uh, ability to question and think about and invest in both blue sky thinking, but also kind of building resilience, transparency, safety, security of these systems. Um, so there's a, a, and a focus from the government as well that uh, safe and resilient, responsible use of AI is hugely important. So and, and owning that narrative with with society. So I. Um, just to come back without kind of getting too broad, I think the thought leadership is huge. And the, the fact that, um, you know, our access to talent is what keeps companies like DeepMind here, right? Um, they, the, the, their ability to kind of siphon off really talented individuals that are graduating from our universities um, is why big companies start here and remain here and i think that's one of the things that uh we can double up on as as people start moving less i think that that, that ability to say this is the right place to be to start your business and to to have access to the outside world is, is really important and that that um uh ability for government so i think one one other point i would make is that here in the uk uh 
we are very open and in fact in terms of creating policy uh, we do that hand in hand in glove with uh, the sector um, and with the ecosystem so in the office for AI for example just as one example we have um, an AI council which is made up of uh, industry uh, so in private sector individuals university academics um, and as well as public sector individuals that come together to bring that advice and prioritization and direction to government so that we're not sitting behind you know ivory towers trying to think of what does government need to do but we're being helped by the ecosystem to say this is what the ecosystem needs to thrive and to grow and to continue being uh in a leading position so i think that relationship is also very strong yeah okay that's great sana thank you um Nigel, let me turn to you if i may um and pick up on that conversation that sana and i started having then about reshoring about this idea of sort of national resilience and and and, and shorter supply chains and, and an unwillingness to to rely as heavily as we have on on other regions of the world to to make vital stuff whether it's pharmaceuticals or whether it's components for, for ai machine learning um is that kind of uh reshoring those short supply chains are they even possible in the kind of world that you operate in um that's a great point so i think one of the things that's probably not very visible is when you get into deep tech um there are very limited numbers of suppliers for some of the core underlying technology you take semiconductors for example there are three companies on the planet that can build at the very leading edge of semiconductors. We work with TSMC, who's based in Taiwan, which is kind of an interesting um, geographic position to, uh, to sit in. Um, there's uh, Samsung in Korea, um, Intel in the US, but the reality is Intel has been falling behind. TSMC has been pulling ahead. Um, and so, you know, I think it's unbelievable or impossible to think that you know we in Europe could develop these leading edge semiconductor technologies, for example. And then you get into all other kinds of, you know, even quite what you would think of as quite mundane technologies, things like PCB, the, the printed circuit board technologies that computers get built on, the really leading edge printed circuit boards, companies in China lead in that space um, and you can find suppliers in Europe for some of those technologies but their level of um, technology their um, the volumes they have the, the the pricing at which they can deliver those leading technologies at um, are very very limited and this is you know printed circuit boards that can transmit you know gigabit um, signals between chips and so you know these supply chains in the high-tech community are so intertwined and, and the COVID situation has probably highlighted that um, even more um, that it's it's really impossible to unpick that and so we need to be careful that we don't put in place some policy that actually causes Europe or um, not to be able to compete because we can't get access um, to some of these leading edge um, technologies. I think the other thing that I would just say coming back on um, something a couple of the other panelists have said. Um, I was talking to um, uh, the World Economic Forum yesterday on a, uh, on a, on a panel, and they're, they're talking about this idea of a great reset, um, the idea that COVID creates this great reset. Um, and I think that's true, but I think what is actually happening is we're just going to accelerate existing trends. You know, we were already using video conferencing. Um, we were already using cloud computing. We were already starting to use AI. I think, you know, what happens here is we just accelerate um, some of these trends. Um, globalization, you know, can we unpick it? Can we separate it? You know, I'm not sure at this sort of leading edge of technology. I think globalization is going to be with us. You end up with sector specialists in certain areas, um, areas that have this expertise. And, and I think that just um, continues. Yeah. And, and Nigel, from where you sit, a unicorn based in Bristol, I think, um, we, we've had this vision from, from John of a sort of bipolar world. US and China has really been the center of the global competition. Sana letting us think about the kind of role that the UK and the EU can play within that in thought leadership and, and, and building on the networks that exist within, you know, within our region. Um, do you see a, 
a, a usefulness for from where you sit in being able to straddle this great divide that um, that John has pointed to between the US and China? Could we could we play both ends if we get it right? No, absolutely. So so a couple of points there. Um, so, so the first thing to understand, you know, people think somehow government is driving this either in the US or in China. I completely disagree. Um, if you look at this from the perspective of some of the big tech companies, AI is existential. If somebody else develops leading edge AI quicker than Google does, Google's toast. Um, somebody else can replace them. They seem impregnable. They seem like they own all search. But somebody else gets AI right, you know, for example, understanding what's really happening in videos so that you can actually place advertising inside a video that you could perhaps, you know, replace some object in a video with, um, you know, some uh, uh, subliminal advertising that is relevant to that particular video, you know. That's what Google's worried about. That's why they're investing fortunes into this. That's why Facebook is investing fortunes into this. That's why Google buys DeepMind, um, because it's just existential to these massive companies. Same for Alibaba, same for um, Tencent. What the difference is, is that in China, um, the Chinese government has a much more you could call it cooperative relationship with some of these big tech companies. You could call it much more intrusive relationship with some of these big um, uh, tech companies. And, and, and they're coordinating much more between, as, as John pointed out, you know, some of the centralizing of databases, um, for example, of you know, people um, in, in the community. But it's being driven fundamentally by business. Um, I think one of the things that is really important to understand is today um, governments don't own the biggest computers, businesses do. Yeah. You know, there are much <laughs> larger compute systems owned by companies than, than by governments. And so, um, you know, I think that that is something that is probably not um, fully obvious to people. Okay, um, I'm going to start. We've got some people who've got their hands up, um, and I'm going to start um, coming to them in a minute. I'll come to Tarek Sholi in just a second. But before, before I come to Tarek, um, John, let me just come back to you because Nigel talked about this point, which I think a lot of people think is correct, that, that um, this pandemic may accelerate trends that were already visible. And probably one of those trends was the sort of the, the splitting of the internet and, and the sort of technological world into three spheres, a US, a EU and a Chinese sphere. Do you see this as likely to accelerate that trend? Well, I agree with Nigel's broad point that uh, uh, all crises accelerate existing trends and, and some of them are economic, uh, some of them will be uh, uh, technology, technology based. But I've, I'm afraid that one of the trends that will be accelerated is the downturn in US-China relations as well and the greater sense of rivalry and competition between the two. Um, and while I agree with, uh, with uh, and, and in, uh, to the extent I understand uh, the details of technology, I agree with uh, the most of what Nigel says. <clears throat> I, I'm not sure this point about globalization. I do think we probably hit peak globalization. Uh, it's very interesting how uh, uh, China has this made in China 2025 policy, uh, which they don't speak about so much now because they know it's a threat to the West, but they're still driving ahead with it. The determination to be masters of all the main industrial technologies by 2025. That doesn't mean <clears throat> that no other country will master it, but China will be, <coughs> sorry, will have independent uh, control uh, of, of, those, uh, of, 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 of the technology space there. Um, and I think on the defense and security side, we've seen both uh, on the Chinese side and on the American side, that their war planners have to think about the worst case. What happens if we get into a hot war with one another? Well, US defense systems are very heavily dependent on, Ch on components from China. And so the, the Pentagon is determined to decouple itself from dependence on China in the same way that China is determined to decouple itself from dependence on America. So uh, 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 technology is gonna be at the heart of this future race. I don't think there'll be a hot war, uh, but I do think there's a real risk of another Cold War, uh, but this time between two economies of equal size and technology is going to be at the heart of that. OK, I can see in the chat that someone, Tim, is already pointing out that I've missed out a fourth fear. He says we should pay attention to the way that Russia is developing as well in the Internet. But um, thanks for that, Tim. Um, Tarek, are you there? Yes, I am. Tarek, thanks for joining us. Um, tell me, what, what's, um, what's been your observation so far? 
I just want to say, firstly, I think it's uh, by mistake that I've been uh, allocated as a panelist. <laughs> so I don't know if that was... Uh, the only way um, we can see your face, I think, so that's why. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Um, and I must admit, I was changing a nappy, so I've, uh, this is just me coming in late. But I mean, I think the... Um, I think I'll probably leave it at that and, and maybe you can come back to me after I've had a bit more time to form thoughts. So apologies. All right, let me come back to you. Um, <laughs> while, while you're changing your nappy or doing whatever else you're doing, um, Sana, let me, let me pick up with you um, something that Nigel brought up, which I think is very important. Um, again, we have framed this as a, as a race between oh. nations. Um, uh, and actually, we've done that despite the fact that one of the things we've done at Tortoise is to start to look at big tech companies as if they were countries, organisations with the same sort of reach, some of the same sort of structures. And, and we, you know, we found it useful to ask some of the same sort of questions of big tech companies as we might ordinarily ask of, um, of countries. What, if you had to sort of characterise the balance between a national race and a corporate race, which of those do you think is more, more important here? Um, so I think a lot of the, the, the things that Nigel said are, are really important um, in, in terms of what it is that's driving these races, right? So um, if, you, if you're thinking about a corporate race, the, the, um, what's driving corporations is still the bottom line, right? And I think it's really, really important that from a, a government perspective, um, that we think of, this, of society as a whole, right? Um, and make sure that we are uh, encouraging use of technology that is for the benefit of all, rather than just a few. Um, and, and making sure that we aren't splitting kind of our society between the has and have nots and, and increase, increasing that, um, that chasm even larger, right? So from, from the perspective of governments, or when you think about it as a national strategy, um, we have to think about a whole bunch of different things. So how do we enable, how does government create the foundations to allow innovation to thrive? And that includes kind of collaborating with like-minded countries. It includes infrastructure, both in kind of access to data and data sharing principles, but also kind of physical infrastructure, broadband, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, it also includes kind of the, the right levels of policies and regulation and, um, uh, and, and, and thinking about ethics and that public narrative. Um, so it's, it's, it's much broader than just what the, what's driving uh, corporate use. So I think from, from, from our perspective in the UK, we've done a lot of work. And again, we've worked with companies um, in some of this in terms of um, our online harms paper. So which is trying to limit the use of technology in, and so that it, it, it limits online harm. Um, and principles around that, principles around kind of innovation friendly regulation to, to ensure that we are allowing our, com our companies, our corporations to innovate um, within, within, a, within the boundaries that um, allow societies to thrive. Um, and, and, and making sure that there is enough money going into kind of reskilling and upskilling this uh, upskilling society, but, but government can't do that on its own, right? It's about making sure that we're joining up with corporations as they shift kind of what work looks like to make sure society moves along, along that journey. So I think there's just different questions to ask whether, you know, r race is the wrong terminology and it's not, it, it cannot be used in, 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 uh, you know, one dimensionally. And, and John's absolutely right. I think when it comes to China and the US, they're kind of using AI uh, or putting AI in, as in the center of, 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 of a war that they had, or like, you know, whatever, it's not a war, but you know, uh, a, a confrontation they've had for a very long time, which is an economic kind of race to um, be the leader. Yeah. And this is, it's, so it, it, technology has been kind of thrown in there. Um, uh, but it, it, I think race is the wrong terminology. Okay, we usually get the question wrong somehow. Um, let, me, let me turn to Omar Aboshi. I think you're there in the, um, I think I can see you, Omar. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, this is something you thought about for a long time. I know what, um, what um, is Sana right? Is race the wrong way to think about this? Um, uh, well, so firstly, thank you very much for having me on. Um, I'm really enjoying the conversation and I agree with many of the points I'm hearing and have been following the chat room carefully to try and see 
you know, what the big thrust is. Actually, I agree completely with John that there is um, a decoupling happening uh, between China and the US that is going to continue independent of the current administration. Uh, and, and yes, of course, it's a race. It's a, it's a, a race around power, uh, economic strength and military strength and, and technology in all the arrays of technology, AI being just one, uh, is where the race is happening. And, you know, you heard about telecom equipment and semiconductors and all of that uh, is indeed happening. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, Europe and the UK's role in particular is something that we should be very willing to talk about and, and say, like, actually, are we happy to let, you know, these two big superpowers run away uh, and we're sort of on the receiving end and, and having to choose sides? I think that's mistaken and short-sighted. Um, yes, we can lead on regulation and Europe is indeed doing that and that is good and, and will continue. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, when you ask the question, why, why should Europe have big technology companies? Uh, the answer is it's, it is indeed about the innovation and the technology that is dispersed by big technology companies fundamentally changes the way we live. Uh, it changes every aspect of society, changes every aspect of business. And we have a choice. Do we want to be on the receiving end of all of that? Or are we going to contribute and, and propagate our own values and our own ways of, of living? I personally think that we need to be much more proactive uh, in driving that forward uh, in Europe and in the UK. And I think we need to think about carefully how to do that. Um, I think uh, uh, N Nigel spoke earlier about uh, semiconductors and indeed Intel, Samsung, TSMC are, are mega players. I think I'm not wrong in saying that the company that produces the equipment that they will use to make semiconductors uh, is ASML, which is a Dutch company. Uh, you know, Arm uh, is a UK based company for the design of uh, chips in mobile technology. We, we completely are capable of innovation. The question is, how do we scale? How do we um, form capital? How do we help encourage big companies to form? So, that so we what's, you know, what's missing? Because you say there's, there's capacity out there, there's, there's talent, there's, you know, we've got great universities, great research, all of those, all of those component pieces are there. What are, we, what are we getting wrong? I mean, again, that's not really uh, my speciality, but I, I say, I mean, we have more fragmented markets. Uh, we have a more fragmented approach to regulation. Uh, we, we make it harder uh, for, for companies to raise capital. I mean, it is a fact that it is much harder to raise venture capital and private equity capital in Europe than in the US. Just look at the fund sizes. And so uh, I think government can play an incredible role of bringing together innovators, entrepreneurs, innovation hubs and capital formation to help encourage the growth of these sorts of businesses. And we're just not as proactive about it. Uh, so, you know, top down led a la the China model or market led uh, out of the US was sort of somewhere in between uh, and so yeah. we don't get it quite as effective as it yeah. could. Let me just jump to you Nigel on that point that um, Omar has just raised. Are, are you nervous about access to capital, access to finance after this or, or um, you know what do you think? Well I think a crisis like this and I've lived through a couple um, you know always causes um, a rush to quality so companies that are strong, um, you know, tend to continue to be able to access capital. You know, the prices may, um, you know, readjust slightly, but, but strong companies will continue to be funded. What, what is more concerning is companies that are perhaps earlier in the cycle with a less proven um, business model. They're the ones that we're at risk of um, damping out if we're not careful here. And, you know, I think that's a real problem. You know, I'm a big fan of the, the future fund that has been put forward by the government that's going to help some of these smaller companies to, to keep a leg up and, and perhaps survive through this. You know, we're at risk. We've started to build an entrepreneurial culture in the UK particularly, um, and we need to try and sustain that and, and carry it forward. You know, we can't wipe out a whole generation of, of startup companies over the next um, year or two. So, you know, for us, you know, we're in a very strong position, you know, again, to the point, you know, we're a British company, we've raised nearly half a billion dollars in um, investment for our business. Um, we're sitting with $300 million of cash on in the bank, um, ready to grow and continue to invest um, in our technology. But that's what it takes, you know, for us to compete. Um, that's the kind of levels you need to have the ambition to get out and, and raise capital for. Okay. Um, Dom Tyler, you've been waiting very patiently to um, come in. Thanks for joining us. Um, what's been, I've seen you very actively in the chat on a number of things. What, what, what's caught your eye so far? Um, so I think it's kind of a couple of things, and it was mainly um, aimed uh, mainly after Nigel's point about um, 
how companies like uh, Doodle might be disrupted by sort of competitors coming up with better technology. And I guess the question I'd have is sort of, we, we've spoken about, you know, the acquisition of DeepMind. Um, we've talked about, uh, I saw in the chat that people are saying that sort of in India, um, the, the, the data companies are mostly small and medium sized uh, you know, enterprises. And I guess my question is why would the, the large, especially American, but also Chinese tech firms not simply acquire their way out of trouble? We're, we're talking about access to capital now. And again, those companies have such huge cash piles often trapped outside of the US. They can just buy their way, uh, just, just buy any companies which, which could be potential competitors. And I'm wondering what your, um, your thoughts are on how to a, combat that maybe? Is it, is it worth you know, protecting um, these national players in the UK, Israel, etc.? Or do we just allow them to be, um, to be acquired and, and, and perhaps stay in the UK, perhaps not? Okay, well, let me, thanks for that. Let me pick up on that and actually turn to Sana. Sana, is that, is that any part of the conversation in this country about how we preserve assets that people like you have been carefully building up? You mean, how do we make sure our unicorns aren't getting bought out? <laughs> well, well, before even they're unicorns, you know, I think, you know, we, we, we can go wrong in various different ways, can't we? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think, uh, so, the, it's important that government recognizes or that government recognizes, the, it does recognize the importance of, of technology in the future. And, and this government has been very vocal about the central role that tech plays um, in, in our lives today and, and kind of going forward. And there's been multiple examples of um, investment going into uh into our companies to ensure that they they are stay successful and, and keep going forward the the latest latest of these has been the the future fund uh that was announced a few weeks ago which was uh a package of 1.25 billion um to help our uh our startups and scale-ups continue to raise capital in a time when you know the liquidity in the market is down um so there is definitely an understanding in this in this government that um, that technology plays an incredible role, and it's about you know how much do we want to stand in the way of companies scaling, um, you know, and 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 what's the right level by which you can you can stop? So I mean I I think this is a better question for Nigel in terms of you know what are his perspectives and what, what would he do and, and you know in terms of raising capital when a company gets acquired or moves it's when when they can raise capital much more easily outside but they have to consider when they headquarter somewhere else or or, or leave um, that there are other criteria by which to think about right um, London or the and London especially but the UK is a melting pot of uh, of, of many different kind of bits, including that access to talent, which is such a huge, huge part of growing your, your, uh, your, your base and making your company stronger. Um, the one area is, is, you know, access to kind of, uh, to uh, a market. So making sure that the market is big enough. So if we can allow in the UK, our companies to scale beyond our borders, um, giving them access to other uh, to other markets by putting in the groundwork and the, the the policy and regulatory environment that allows them to do that scaling, then you know I think we we give them less reason to to move and leave. Okay, great. Um, I'm, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, John, I want to come back to you briefly um, because we. I think one of the things we are seeing, uh, and again comes to this question of what this crisis would accelerate um, in trends we'd seen before, is a, is a kind of growing suspicion of of China, particularly in this um, in this respect. So Chinese, even Chinese ownership of companies like TikTok, for example, became controversial um, when it was unclear that the, that the company itself had transgressed in any particularly serious way. Um, and because of your background and your particular perspective on this, you know, I think, again, we might see more suspicion of Chinese academics, Chinese research, all those kind of things, which, which might limit the kind of access to talent that then is so critical for, for a company like, like Nigel's. Um, it, it, it's a very big question, but do you think that suspicion is justified if you look at it perhaps through the lens of something like the, the Huawei debate in this country? 
Well, I, I, I think we have to go into this with our eyes very firmly open. Uh, on the Huawei issue, I was one of those who've uh, had experience of, of how we mitigate the risk uh, to our telecoms network uh, with Chinese made uh, equipment. And I think we can manage that. I think the problem is not so much do we buy Huawei equipment for our 5G network, it's, it's how do we avoid the situation for 6G and 7G and 8G uh, where we, we are dependent upon Chinese suppliers. Um, we need to develop an industrial policy as, as uh, Sana and others, and Omar Abosh was very uh, 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 eloquently describing, uh, where we're not forced into, into that situation. Um, I do think, though, that um, we're going to uh, find uh, that we're going to have some difficult choices to make. Um, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to collaborate equally with the Chinese as we do with the uh, uh, with the Americans. Um, uh, I, I think being outside the European Union, something which I regret, but there may be areas that, uh, where we're, we're liberated a bit from some of the uh, uh, EU, uh, EU regulation, so the technology sector might be able to benefit from that. I certainly, when I talk to uh, 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 Americans about technology in Europe, the country they mention above all others is the UK. And they were mentioned the same breath as Israel and, and, and India as potential partners on, on, on technology issues. So I think that's really, really important. <clears throat> but I'm conscious I didn't answer actually your earlier question about the Internet. I do think the Internet is an Internet control is going to be another new area of global competition. It's basically been dominated by the private sector and by Western governments so far. Um, I think the Chinese are going to try to gain total control of their aspects of the Internet. And they will use um, their sort of uh, Belt and Road diplomacy, if you like, to build a wider sense amongst those other countries uh, that, uh, uh, yes, we should go along with a Chinese vision for the Internet, which gives um, uh, complete state control over the flow of information on it, uh, rather than the Western free nature of the Internet. So I think that is another area of competition that is likely to grow. Okay. Um, look, normally I leave the overrunning to my colleague James Harding, but I've managed to do it myself this time. So I'm afraid um, we are going to have to, to wrap up at this point. Um, uh, Sana, Nigel, John, everybody else, thank you so much. It's been a really, I've been trying to keep my eye on the chat as best I can uh, in the margins here, and it's been really fascinating and productive as well. If I'm going to take one thing from it, I think it's I've got to go and read more by Joanna Bryson because she's getting referenced left, right and centre by everybody in the, in the conversation. Um, just briefly to try to, to, to sort of pick the main points out of this as best I can. I mean, I, I think I, I start where, where John started, that in the, at the moment, and, and as Omar said, we might regret it, um, this is fundamentally uh, a conversation, a competition between the US and China, um, I think 80% plus of, of investment in this area is in, is in one of those two countries. So the, the money speaks loudly in that respect. Um, and the question, uh, you know, I think as Nigel said, we assume in this area, as in a number of others, that the pandemic will be an accelerant of pre-existing trends rather than necessarily establishing a brand new direction. Um, and that leads us to the sort of fascinating question of an accelerant of what? Is it an accelerant of the kind of collaboration that, uh, that Sana hopes we're going to see? Is it a kind of acceleration of the kind of international collaboration, international sharing of talent that uh, companies like Graphcore are so reliant on? Or is it uh, an accelerant of the kind of decoupling that, that John talked about and a number of others raised as well? I think um, you know, things could change in November after the uh, US presidential election. At the moment, it feels worryingly as if it might be accelerating the decoupling, the reshoring, the divisions that have, that have come to exist. Um, but that's an open question. And for the moment, uh, I think we have to, um, you know, it's a watching brief and we have to, we have to you know, hope for the best on that. Um, I'll leave it there. Um, thanks again to everybody. The next session starts in 11 minutes. So a cup of coffee and, and do come back. But thank you, everybody. And um, goodbye for now.